Good morning, everybody. Are you ready for the holidays? Say yes. 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 First, thank you, Eric, for an exceptionally interesting and informative session on uh, marketing last time. We only wish we'd have had the whole day for that topic. There's a lot of substance there. So, any questions before we begin? I, I want to alert you right now. This topic is one of a special passion for me. And so I may soapbox it a couple of times as we go through it, only because it's such a big deal for me. And Joe, you made a comment before about the e-myth. Mm -hmm. uh, would you share that with us, please? Uh, which one? No, no. <laughs> I, I was just saying that, uh, um, which I had read it about five years ago, I probably would not have really gotten as much out of it as I did as I, I Thank you very much. Now, if you haven't already got and started looking at the e-myth, or if you read it years ago, I'm going to encourage you to get back into it and do it again with today's perspective, because it's potentially quite transformative. It has the potential for setting you up for long-term success in a way that nothing else I've ever seen can do. So I encourage you to do that. I am embarrassed to ask, what is the e-myth? Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. <laughs> e is for entrepreneurial. It's a book. Okay. Yeah. Camera. Okay. And it's about why small businesses don't work and what to do about it. It's just outstanding work. I've been working with it since 1986 and highly encourage people to get into it. Yes, sir. It does come difficult. Yeah, I have the uh, the e -ver the Kindle version, and the hard copy version, and it's only what twelve, fifteen bucks, something like that, in either edition. All right. Go ahead, James. No, I was going to say he came with a paper book and asked for a mouse with a tail on it. I'm all sorts of confused this morning. <laughs> Leading edge technology from 1990. <laughs> You know, the one thing I'll say about the myth is, you know, I know that there's something wrong with my business, and, you know, because it's just not feeling right. Everything's going great, but it's still not. And I keep on going to consultants and say, well, well, we'll help you get more customers. And then after reading the myth, it just helped me crystallize. I don't need more customers. I need a better business. That, that's the wrong answer, isn't it? Right. And just as a preface, first, I want you all to understand how deeply I respect what you do to run a small business, to start it, grow it, make it keep going, is just astonishing. You're just amazing people and I respect you for that. Secondly, uh, like Joe was saying, you're doing the best you know how to do at the time, right? You're working as hard as you can and doing the smartest thing. So it's not a matter of working hard. It's a matter of working a little differently on different things, which is what we're going to start today. Fair enough? So, let's review marketing real quickly. Marketing concepts in two minutes. You see, go just throw at a party, you go up to her and say, I'm very rich, marry me. That is direct marketing. You are at a party <laughs> with a bunch of friends and see a gorgeous girl. One of your friends goes up to her and pointing at you says, He's very rich. Marry him. That is advertising. You see a gorgeous girl at a party. You go up to her and get her telephone number. The next day you call and say, Hi, I'm very rich. Marry me. That is telemarketing. You go at a party and see a gorgeous girl. You get up and straighten your tie. You walk up to her and pour her a drink. You open the door of the car for her, pick up her bag after she drops it, offer her a ride and then say, By the way, I'm rich. Really marry me. That is public relations. You are at a party and see a gorgeous girl. She walks up to you and says, you are very rich. Can you marry me? That is brand recognition. You see a gorgeous girl at a party. You go up to her and say, I'm very rich. Marry me. She gives you a nice hard slap on your face. That is customer feedback. You see a gorgeous girl at a party. You go up to her and say, I am very rich, marry me, and she introduces you to her husband. That is demand and supply gap. You see a gorgeous girl at a party, 
You go up to her, and before you say anything, another person come and tell her, I'm rich, will you marry me? And she goes with them. That is competition eating into your market share. You say, gorgeous girl at a party, you go up to her, and before you say, I am rich, marry me, your wife arrives. That is restriction for entering new markets. <laughs> so that's two minutes on marketing, got it? Any questions, see Eric. <laughs> How do we get rich first? Yeah. <laughs> I'm rich, just call me and I'll come right over. Here you go. Today we're going to really talk about two core things. First, how your customers see your business. And here's a news flash. It's not the same way you see it. So in that we're going to talk about the customer experience and we're going to look at a thing called the customer journey and the customer journey map. And then we're actually going to create that for our own businesses. And then we're going to move into the core of creating a system that delivers the product and service that you offer. And we're going to look at how to prevent things from going wrong that you may not even be aware of at this point. So we're going to get what I call the customer bug list, things that bug our customers start working on that. Again, this is the first step in a fairly long journey, but this will give you something very tangible to work on right away. So when you leave here today, you will have some worksheets filled out and we have some spares that you can take with you and continue this process. Fair enough? Okay. So now you have holiday homework. <laughs> Thanks, Bernie. In the e-myth, and you've probably all heard this, work on your business, not just in it. You all heard that? Right. A real pithy quote, and I love it. It's a good sound bite. My question though is what does it mean? To me, it's the equivalent of telling a six-year-old, be careful. Right. What does it mean to be careful? Right? It's good advice, but there's no behavior attached to it. Well, work every would it be fair for me to assume that you all work hard in your business? You work hard at marketing, you work hard at customer service, you work hard at fulfilling and solving problems and all those things. Is that right? What does it mean to work on your business? Sarah? What it means is that um, you step back and you work on the systems, the processes. You, your business itself is a product. And so you actually have to build that product so that that product will work and do other things. It's not the same as working harder inside your business. It's a different animal entirely. And that's what we want to introduce now. You have to take a step back from working with the customers and your marketing and so on and look at it from a, a real distance and see how that works and then work on the mechanisms by which the, the business works. Yes, ma'am. I, I think for me that the really important thing is, is that it's easier said than done and that it never is finished. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we look at it, we go, oh yeah, cool, I'm gonna work on my business today and you work on it and it, it's never finished, just like being a mom. And it's real easy to say you were doing that, but it's harder to block out that time and do it. Absolutely. So Simon Sinek has a really interesting book out called Start With Why, and he's got a good TED presentation. If you haven't heard it, <laughs> check with me and I'll direct you to it. But he says it has to start with why. So why should you care about working on your business instead of just in it? What's the value there? Well, first, it's the only way you can free up yourself so that the business is working for you and not you working for your business. In other words, you become an owner instead of an employee. Does that make sense? So if you want to take the weekend off, that's doable. But the business continues serving customers and making money. The second reason is for your customers. One of the key points in any business is consistency, right? 
Customers need to know what they're going to get when they come to work with you. That's why McDonald's succeeded. It isn't the quality of the great food, it's knowing what you're going to get each and every time, no matter where you are. And so this is how you get there. And so we're going to work on the how and the what as we go forward in these workshops. Fair enough? To start with a little personal story. I lived in Phoenix, and in one, uh, in Phoenix, grass is different than it is here. There's a winter grass and a summer grass. The summer grass is Bermuda, and it just lives all, all the year round, but in the winter time, it's too cold, it goes dormant. So you have to plant what's called winter rye. And that doesn't live forever, you have to plant it every season. You have to get rid of all the old stuff and scrape it down to the dirt, essentially, go buy new <laughs> seed, put it on there, put some fertilizer on top and water it. It's a whole process. You have to do that about September when it's 140 degrees outside. So I was doing that one day, and I'd heard this ad on the radio for the super giant mega big gulp drink thing for 69 cents. I said, that's for me. I had to run over to the Home Depot anyway, so I stopped by the store to get one of those. Walked in the store, and of course I was not really clean and dressed up, right? It was, I was awful looking and smelling probably. So I walked in and I looked around, nobody there to ask of course, and there was a big arrow suspended from the ceiling with the promotion pointing right at the machine. So I found the biggest cup I could find, I filled it up with stuff, a little ice on it, I took it up to the cash register and he says, great, that's a dollar twenty-nine. I said, well, wait a minute, you've been advertising this, you have the big arrow up there, you know, 69 cents, that's what I buy. He says, well, you didn't get the big one. You got the downsize from the big one. That's $1.29, it's not on sale. And I said, oh, okay, I understand. If you could tell me where the big ones are, I'll go get that. He says, oh, well, they're kind of around the back and the side of the machine <laughs> where you can't really spot them, and so, you know, you, you just need to do, but you have to pay for this one first. I said, no, you don't understand. I came in exclusively because you advertised. I want the 69 cent one. I thought that's what I got. He said, well, it doesn't matter. You have to buy this, this one, and then you can, you know, you're welcome to go get the special. And I said words, something like the horse you rode in on, you know. And I turned around and walked out. And he said to me, and these are his exact words. You shouldn't be upset. This happens all the time. <laughs> okay? In other words, they knew this was a problem. It continued to be a problem, and they did nothing about it. And as far as I know, my drink is still sitting there on the counter because I have not been back. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Tom Peters, the noted management guru, says perception is all there is. And so that's what we want to talk about is perception from the point of view of your customers. Okay, at your tables, real quickly, privately, working on your own, make a list of great car parts. Joe, what's a car part? Uh, bumper, windows, axles, tires, hood, engine. Okay, this table, thank you. Lights, lights, lights. brakes, steering wheel, wheels. You know, would a navigation system be a part? <laughs> You're not counting yourself. Well, that is the most important part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This table. The engine. <coughs> we put those in there. Brakes. <coughs> brakes. We've got brakes. We've got brakes. Seats. Radio. Transmission. Wipers. Fenders. Air conditioning. 
All right. Yeah. You guys miss the fun stuff like blowers and superchargers and nitrous injection. <laughs> How about massaging the seeds? <laughs> All right. Here, here's the point of this kind of icebreaker activity. What if we went out and scoured the world and found the world's very best bumpers, the world's very best windows, axles, and all of these parts, and we brought them into an auto, kind of a warehouse place, what would we have at that point? We'd have a pile of parts. Would that be able to drive you from point A to point B? So your car is not a collection of great parts. It is a transportation system, right? When I say system, what do I mean? Something that's integrated that works together. It's integrated, it's all engineered, it's designed so that it works together to produce the result we're looking for. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. All right. Keep this in mind, we're going to come back to this a little later. It's a profound point. <coughs> Another problem we have is that companies are from Venus, excuse me, companies are from Mars and customers are from Venus. Fair enough? What we mean by that is within your company, you know a lot about what's going on. You know the business, you know the technical side of it, you know how it operates, you know the finances, you know everything about the company, and from your point of view, the company's the center of the world. Am I right so far? No. Is that why companies are from Mars? Yes. <laughs> Customers are from Venus. Customers have their interests in mind their needs, wants, and so on. And I've got a terrible piece of news for you this morning. Customers do not care about your business. At all. Ever. They care about what you can do for them. And as soon as you stop doing that, next. Does that make sense? They really don't care about us and our business. To your customer, they are the center of the universe. So, anybody drive their car here this morning with the radio on? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Did you listen to station WIFM? How many of you listened to that? Everybody put your hand up and say, I did. I did. Oh, yeah, well, that one, yeah. <laughs> Radio station, it's the most popular radio station in the known universe. What's in it for me? Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? That's the only station any of us ever tune into. And customers are infinitely self-interested. So in the future, I want you to think of a customer as having this sign on their forehead. What's in it for me? And you have to answer that or there's no deal. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Now I have some proof. As a matter of fact, the world does revolve around me. I have more evidence. There are coffee mugs that say so. That proves it. <laughs> right? <laughs> customers only care about this. Just like when we're customers. Right? We go into Home Depot, we really don't care about the Home Depot organization. What do we care about? Solving our immediate problem. So this is how your business is viewed. From your point of view, you see it as the owner or senior manager as the integrated system. You've got your marketing finding customers, the sales, doing transactions, fulfillment, giving the customer what they have bought, finance, somebody has to collect the money, pay the bills, that sort of thing, customer service, and administration, hiring people, getting all the permits, all the administrative things you have to do in your business. 
That's what you see. Is that fair? Okay? If you're an employee in that business, you don't see it the same way. You see it from your particular point of view. If you're in sales, have I met my quotas? Am I making enough sales to make the commission or the money I need? And if you're in marketing, have we done all the campaigns that we need? What's the ROI? What's the hit rates? And so on. We're measured on our in individual job. And the same thing across the board. Fair so far? From the customer's point of view, that's not what they see. They see a seamless, horizontal experience throughout your business. They see the marketing, they go in and talk to somebody and make a sale. They want to get what they, they have to pay for it. Customer service, they want somebody to respond to them and so on. Does that make sense? Here's the point. At every single one of those contact points, at marketing, at sales, at fulfillment, and so on, that contact point is the whole business in the mind of the customer. When they walk in the front door, they talk to whoever's at the front desk, that's comp center in their mind. There is no all the rest of it. Does that make sense? Is that true from your experience? All you're seeing is that immediate point of contact. That represents the whole business. Okay? Based on that then, we want to understand two things. We want to understand the customer journey, what the customer actually goes through, and then the cycle of service, which is what we do to help the customer get what they want. Two totally separate points of view. Okay? understand this process, let's talk about something we're all pretty familiar with, going to the movies. It's a pretty simple example. You've all been to the movies, right? Tell me real quickly, Tom, what happens when you go to the movies? You get in the car and? Drive. And then you get to the park. movies? Yep, park the car. You go in and see the movie? And I have to go in and yes, choose one fine. and pay for it first. Yep. And then? Walk in. See the movie. Yeah. Choose the movie. And then choose the best seat. Yeah, choose the best seat. That's correct. Yeah. And then you're out and so on. All right. Most people think of going to the movies as I get in the car, I'll go see the movie, I'll leave, and then however good the movie was determines how good the overall experience was. Right? And that is totally not true. Never was and it won't ever be because you had it exactly right from the beginning. We're going to follow this journey from going into the theater to exiting the theater. And for this purpose, we're going to exclude all the outside things like the advertising, the social media, the chatting at the coffee, and so on. We're just going to talk about, I've decided to go to the movie, and then we do that. Okay? So, you're right, we park the car. And by the way, your handouts have all this in there, so you got to follow along. We wait in line to buy a ticket. Then we get up to the front of the line. We buy the ticket. We go inside about 20 feet. We take that piece of paper they gave us, and somebody <laughs> takes it and tears it up and throws it away. So we have to get in line to get Tom's refreshments. Then we get to the front of that line, we pay for all of that stuff, and we have to get ourselves mentally and physically prepared for this two-hour experience, right? So we go visit that sideline. Speaking of restroom, if you ever want to really understand exactly how a company or organization thinks about their customers, just go visit their public restrooms, and in less than 10 seconds, you'll know everything you need to know about their real attitude toward the customers, right? Soapbox time, sorry. So you go into the theater, find the seats you want, watch the movie, exit the theater, and you get back in the car and leave. 
Does that kind of capture the going to the movies experience? Now, there are three characteristics. Some of those variables are totally controllable by you. In this experience, what might, might be some things that you have total control over as the theater owner? Oh, you mean as the theater owner? Not the as the theater owner. Um, you can check to make sure that you have sufficient parking. Um, I mean that you have a big enough parking lot so people can park easier. Um, you can make sure that the restrooms are clean, that the theater is clean, the floor is not sticky, stuff doesn't smell. Um, you can have enough people to service people when they go to buy food. The popcorn can be fresh and not stale. Um, you can have pleasant people that they meet all the way through that. You can keep your trash cans empty. You have control over that. Those things, yes. That, that's a category that you as the owner can have, have a direct control over. There are some things that are completely outside your control. What might some of those be? If they don't like the movie at all, okay. or if they get there late and they can't find the seats they want, maybe they came with someone and they have to sit across the theater from them. Okay. It always ruins my movie experience. Other the customers. weather. Great. Other customers being rude and obnoxious. Yeah. So, admittedly, in every <coughs> business, there are some things you can't control. It just happens. You have to kind of deal with that. And then there are some things you can influence, but maybe not directly control. Okay? Such as where you put the ads that are supplied to you by the studio. Okay? how you display things. And I think to some degree the cleanliness and things like that might fall into either controllable or influenceable because when you get a big crowd, sometimes you can't keep up with all of it. Okay? Does that make sense so far? We're on board. All right. So, transitioning from the movies to your business. What are your moments of truth? Every single one of those points is a moment of truth where it can either go well or it can go poorly, as we've already talked about, right? You can have a bad experience at any of these touch points, or you can have a good experience. So think about your business, what are your moments of truth? And so that brings us to our first activity for the day. You have at your table a worksheet like this. So take a few moments and Try to sketch out, as best you can, what your customer goes through to do business with you from the point where they enter the business to the point where they leave. And if you're completely online, it would be when they log on or hit your landing page until they exit. Okay? Now pick one specific experience. Most likely you have several different customer categories and they may have different journeys. So pick at least one to try to work your way through that. Make sense? Would you tell us uh, what business and what customer category you've talked about, please? I am a certified financial planner. Right. And I um, work with individuals clients and help them with remind them of the um, Then I prepare for the meeting, and the clients arrive in the parking lot, and they come into the office, and then I greet them and offer them beverages, and then I discuss the matters that we've talked about, and we talk about a lot of different things, and then the clients do use the restroom. Um, we conclude the meeting, I walk the clients to the door, the clients drive home happy, and then I implement decisions. Okay. And at some point, is there a discussion about um, how you get paid? Not usually, because that's already taken care of. Okay. This is not a new client. This is a um, return a client. client. Yeah, I, I do quarterly meetings with them. Okay. Good. Be sure to make that note, because most likely you have other categories of clients as well, and you don't want to confuse one category with a different one. How about somebody from this table? Go for it. All right. Um, so they, they obviously contact me. Yes. Uh, might, you might even want to say how. So it's either email or phone. Um, we have a conversation, blah, blah, blah. We develop specs and pricing. 
a law, then they have then we need to go through prep artwork or whatnot because we're talking about printing something. Um, so the next two steps are iterative design approval, design approval, make it stuff in the tool for a while. And they move over and we finally produce high select payments. And they're delighted and they exit. All right. And Ideally. they paid you and that's yes. it. The piece is produced and they get delivery of the merchandise. They get delivery of it. They look at it and say, this is great. They use it. They scratch my name. And, and All right. Excellent. How about this table? Ladies? Yeah. Let's hear about the comm center experience. This will be interesting. Mm -hmm. We all um, have it. <laughs> well, I pick somebody that um, saw us on a website. Okay. And they come in. They were they're walking. So the first uh, person I see is Kelly at the front desk, which is a welcoming experience. And then she'll direct them to the coffee cafe to have a beverage. Um, there's music playing, there's a flat screen TV, the whole first floor is an art gallery, um, I think there's a lot of ambiance that they're taking in with their first visit, um, then when I meet them, um, I'll find out what their basic needs are and introduce them to the comm center and give them a tour and kind of talk about the place as we walk around. and. Um, the restrooms are nice and clean all the time. And uh, then before the person leaves, I usually sit down with them and then we talk a little more in detail about what their needs and what their questions might be. Right. And um, hopefully they're happy, they're impressed, and they sign a contract. <laughs> all right. And give me a check. <laughs> okay, good deal. How about this table? Tom? Well, I'm on the product end of, uh, with Eric, um, so I'll go with uh, customer contact through our marketing. Uh, they, they do a, a presentation or they see us, they contact us. Um, first thing to do is sit down with the customer, explore their needs. Mm -hmm. So not just what they want, but what they actually need. Um, set up a uh, second appointment. They leave, develop the presentation on what we discussed. Uh, meet back with the customer, make the presentation. Uh, make adjustments as needed, uh, same with pr uh, uh, printing. Um, recheck with the customers, make sure they're satisfied, place the order, uh, receive the order, deliver the product, <coughs> get paid, um, follow up with the customers, see if they're satisfied, and set up a second meeting for further products or things that we can do for them. Okay, excellent. Yes, ma'am. just want to say one thing, in my experiences in life, I find that a lot of people, they don't think they know what they need, but they don't know what they need. So it's that clarification, discovery, professional and showing, and showing them all their options, which might trigger an idea that they weren't thinking about. Excellent. All right. Yes, sir. It kind of, you know, that reminds me of the, the comment that you've made that people don't buy drill bits, they buy holes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like Tom mentioned, you know, a little we'll talk about, you know, if customer says that they need or they want, but we dig a little bit deeper to find out, okay, why do you want this? You know, what are you going to do with it? Because the, the customer might say, you know, hey, I, you know, I need a gizmo to do, well, you know, like, you know, James was looking at something with a US, for a USB drive. Mm -hmm. And knowing some of the other things that they're doing, uh, well, you know, we should, here's some USB drives, but we should look at one that will integrate not just with the computer, but with the cell phone also, to help with some of the other services that, that Bernie's wanting to offer. Because I, you know, I know enough about their business to know what they're trying to implement. Sure. And they, you know, they didn't know about the product. They didn't know it existed, so they didn't know to ask for that. And they couldn't. And yeah. so we got them a sample, and it works. And so, does that happen to everybody? Mm -hmm. You know more than your customers do, and you enlighten them to new opportunities mm -hmm. they had no way to even know. Okay. I want to make an observation from what you did. Was this an interesting exercise? Yeah. I want you to notice something. In every one of what you said, 
you fuse together what the customer does with what you do. Right? In this little map, and this is part of the discovery process, the outside is the customer only. Anything you do goes on the inside. Okay? So the customer journey is the exterior of the circle. The cycle of service, what you do, is what's on the inside. And it's really hard to separate those out because of the Mars-Venus thing. You know, we are so absorbed with what we do, we assume that's what the customer does at the same time. And that's not the case. I think, you know, I, I, this last year I've really gotten into the ability to use slides and convey complicated messages with images. And I think what would be interesting is you could almost do this big wheel as um, maybe as your business and then do another wheel which is the customer and maybe possibly several because the customer experience dr should drive the wheel of your business. If they should, like cogs, they should go like this. And when they don't meet and they don't intertwine and these pieces are missing, yeah. it's like a broken watch. I mean, you can wear it and still go around. But and it's right twice a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, as, you, as you're saying this, I think that that's kind of, you know, we think that maybe we drive the business or maybe just the customer drives the business, but if they don't, if they don't operate like that, it's broken. Exactly. Yeah. And at a future time, we'll, we'll get to an integrated model. What I had hoped to do today is point out the customer is on one track, you're on a different track and they are not the same. The interesting thing about this, this diagram, if I look at this, it looks to me like me, the business is in the center and the customer is walking around my universe. And we know that that's not true. The other thing- Yeah, um, that's a good point. And the other thing is that, you know, we talked about us consulting, you know, and advising the customer. And, and I find um, most, uh, many times, I, I have to pause and listen because sometimes they have ideas that we've never thought of. Mm -hmm. They have experiences from, from, from other, mm -hmm. other journeys that they've had, and, and I learn so much from my customer. So it's, it's not just a one-way, it's not just a one-way it, It's back to the interacting gears. The, the, the concept. And the interaction. And excellent. The there. Yes. That, that's an excellent point because something that I've learned in sales is that when a customer asks for something, even if you know that it's totally the wrong thing for them, if you don't show them what they asked for, it sends a signal that you don't care, you weren't listening. I saw this so clear in the sign industry because, you know, people don't know a lot about signs. And so when somebody, you know, they're going into a new location and they need a sign and they'll meet with a half a dozen different sign companies, and they'll say, I want this, and 75% of the time, it's horrible what they're asking for. So none of the sign companies will show them what they're asking for. They'll show them all sorts of other things. Better but solutions. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what I would, you know, when they would say, you know, I want this, and you know, I would try to find out what it was about that that they were, you know, why they wanted that thing. And I would always show them exactly what they asked for. Mm -hmm. And then I would show them two other solutions. One that would be um, what I would recommend, and another one that would be somewhere in between, kind of, you know, this is the, the common ground between what I think is best for you and what you think is best for you. They would never buy what they had asked for. They'd also never buy from somebody that didn't show them what they asked for. Mm -hmm. So, if you, but if you don't show them what they asked for, you never get the chance to sell them. I just, you know what, what I love when I have a great customer is I'm better. You know, um, not that I don't love all the clients that I have, because if I can't really appreciate them, I don't work with everybody. Uh, but. You just have those days where you work with somebody and you walk out and you just feel like incredible and you became better and you became a better service provider 
and you came out with something that you're going to take into another customer experience because it just evolved into something wonderful. Um, you know, as the wheels go around to me, like that's what happens with Yaz all the time is that my experience with Com Center gets better and we interact and I think we bring more value. I bring value to her too and it goes back and forth. It's that to me is when, when the wheel works right, we all become better. Excellent. And that's the point of stopping for a moment, getting away from the conduct of your business to look at the construction of your business work on your business and that's how we're doing this excellent moving on to point number two you all know Zig Ziglar I hope mm -hmm. you can get everything in life you want if you just help enough other people get what they want right that's one of the best things in history in my opinion so we've talked about it your business is not about you Another quick story. I get my hair cut you know, every three, four weeks, whatever. And I went in uh, September to the haircut place that I go to. And it was only me as the customer. The other person who was a customer was just finishing. So I walked in, sat down, and there was a receptionist at the front desk. Okay? So I got my hair cut and stuff, and about halfway or two thirds of the way through, another customer walked in and she asked how long will it be it's a few minutes so I'm almost done here yada 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 and so she said okay I'll wait right so she sat down fit and I got my haircut finished and my stylist sent me over to pay talk to the and she started cleaning up because you have to sweep up the hair and make it look attractive for the next person right so I'm bantering with the receptionist, and I get carried away a little bit. I go on beyond what I, what I should do. And a, after a few minutes of this, the customer who had walked in stood up and said, well, if that's all you're going to do for me, I'll go somewhere else where they care about me. And she left. Okay? She assumed that because I was bantering with the receptionist, nobody was paying attention to her. And she hated that, and she left. When in point of fact, the stylist was making ready for her. Does that sink? Now, here's the point. That business has a systems problem. What did they miss? The transfer from the receptionist to the stylist. If the stylist had walked over and said, um, I'm, ex you know, I'll take a moment here to straighten up so my, my place is fresh and ready for you. I'm looking forward, if you've looked in a magazine or whatever, if she'd had an interaction, then she'd know that she was being moved. That's or right. Or they'd gotten her a cup of coffee or a bottle of water. Exactly. They ignored the customer who was already in the door sitting down mm -hmm. waiting. They took that customer for granted. Right? Because, after all, the stylist had cleanup stuff to do. It was part of her job description is to clean up and make ready. They had a systemic overlook of the customer's experience. Right. But, when this happened, you know the reaction of the stylist? Take a guess. Totally defensive. Well, man, I'm glad she left. You know, she would have been horrible to work with. Better, good riddance, you know? A totally defensive response to something that was essentially their issue in the first place. Because as Sarah said, if they'd have paid any attention to the client, they would have made more money than if they didn't. But, but I'd have to say on the other end too, is like not all client, not all prospects do you want. I've had customers or potential customers that I've worked really hard to bridge that gap and then I was like, oh my God, why did I work so hard? They were they were horrible <coughs> and you know they caused more problems and their money wasn't worth it. <laughs> that I love that that she, Sarah's my shill this morning. She has the transitions all memorized. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's true. I, was, I mean, really, there are some people that that's all they're looking for is what's wrong. 
what's wrong. That's all they're looking for. Sure. Yeah, you, yeah, you can never make it right. They're, they're yeah. never going to be satisfied no matter what you do. No matter what. And those are always the people that don't pay their bill at the end or <laughs> right. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's look at this little graph for a moment. In the center, they got what they wanted. I don't mean to interrupt, but I just... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I fired a client yesterday. Yeah, good. For the first time, but mm -hmm. it was um, a virtual client, and they they were... Does very, Bernie know this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> was he okay <laughs> with it? He's well, racing. I, I egged her on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I... Um, there was, there was a virtual client that had um, mailbox and phone service only with us. And I remember last summer when I was working at the front desk and this individual would call and say, can you check my mailbox? It's raining. I don't want to drive over there. And yeah. you know, these kind of things, like habitually and just very, a um, lot of time, a lot of, uh, took a lot of time off of both Kelly and myself. And then it was, then I came to find out that they owed us a lot of money. Mm. So um, it was hard to get the money from them, and to make a long story short, they gave me a little bit, it wasn't the whole amount, and when I talked to Bernie, I said, you know, this, they're just not worth the aggravation and the time that it takes to, you know, and it was, she was very um, arrogant and complained all the time. She was like a neg negative little thing coming in and out of the lobby every day, checking her mail, and just, yeah. you could not please her. There was no way to please her. Time to release her to and, the universe. You know, it was <laughs> the rest of us appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. You know, this, this, that happens. Firing a client is never fun, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. It, it, it's not just for you. Maybe it's for them. Sure. Maybe they're really not going to be happy with particular services. Sure. Maybe she wanted a lot more than you were willing the, to offer. The 80 20 rule. And thing, she yeah. was dumb. Let, let's let's consider this for just a moment. The center is the neutral place. Value exchanged hands equally. You're happy, they're happy. Into the red area, it escalates from somewhat disappointed to, to really angry. Right? On the right hand side, they're happy, they're pleased, and then Maybe they're delighted, and then maybe they're just ecstatic with you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. On the lower half is the behaviors associated with those emotional states. Because that top is an emotional response, right? So at the bottom, if they're satisfied, they'll prefer you over the next guy. It's just easier to deal with somebody you already know. If they're disappointed, they might complain, or worse, what happens? You never hear about it. If you never hear about it, there's nothing you can do to fix it. It could be a simple misunderstanding, a communication thing that was easily fixed, but if you didn't know about it, you couldn't fix it. If they're really upset, you can count on them talking to other people about it. And in today's world, they go on the social media and really blast it out. If they get really angry, you're talking lawsuits or an anti-website. You ever heard uh, United Breaks Guitars? Yeah. Break that down, look it up on YouTube. A guitar player was traveling on United, and somebody said, they're throwing guitars out there. They broke his Taylor guitar, which was you a know, $2,000 guitar. And so he's a, a musician, he creates a YouTube video song <laughs> to blast United Airlines, and United said, sorry, you signed a disclaimer, it's your problem, not ours. Well, long story short, he ended up winning, but it was years later, and United is destroyed over that. Okay, <laughs> on the other side of the coin, when they're pleased, they prefer you. They're really delighted, they'll become loyal. Come back and come back. But if they're thrilled, that's all, you'll, all they'll take. Won't accept any substitutes, and if they can't get what they want, they'll wait until they can. How many of you know somebody who's a Coke or Pepsi fan and won't drink the other product? Yeah. 
That's insistent. Uh, Chevrolet Ford, yeah, yeah, uh, or, or Mercedes Infinity, you know. So in my view, what we really are looking for is on the right side. We want the insistence as our, our ultimate goal. Where do we spend our time and our energy? Most of the time we're spending it with those people who are happy, right? We are dragged into the left side. They force us there. We would prefer not to be there, but we have no choice. We have to defend ourselves, right? So here's my question on this whole big old thing. How much time do we spend on the right side? How much time do we spend cultivating and re reinforcing those people who are in love with us? Or do we take them for granted? Kind of the marriage thing, right? Does that make sense? I think there's two questions on that, or two things. One Good. is, if we get better at this, we should spend more time you know, with our process. And two, if we really know who our prospect is, if we choose the wrong prospects, they'll pull us here, because we're not really going to serve them. So if we choose better <coughs> prospects and we have a better system like you're talking about, then the two things will work together. That's the point of this entry workshop is to say, let's work on the business and make it better so that it accomplishes those ends more directly. Yes, sir. Richard, uh, I think it was last week you and I were chatting and you shared uh, a little diagram on the board with me. Yeah, we'll have to do that in another workshop, won't well, we? That, I'm telling you, that um, my takeaway from that is exactly what Sarah was saying of ways to to keep people things that we can do as business owners so that people stay on the happy side absolutely because the thing is if you're there are things that you can do as a business owner that will please a customer in a way that even when we do make mistakes even when things go wrong they will overlook those things mm -hmm. it won't be as concerning to them because of some of the other proactive things that we're doing so that they they stay on the right. Business is dating. <clears throat> it's as simple as that. On a date, do you count the dollars and cents spent for the dinner? No. You react to the emotional aspect of the relationship. That's business, folks. Yeah. It's the same thing. I relate that back to when I was a, a corporate manager. 25 years in corporate, in corporate America, and, and I was in a lot of organizations. At one point, when I, when I was told, when I was giving reviews, I was supposed to be spending like 80% of my time with the A people, and very little with, with the, and you know, it's of how much attention that you put in, and um, you know, it's often said, very much like a business, people don't quit companies, they, bit, they quit managers. Right, and so there's that whole thing, and what you what you start learning at the, at the end of once you get into it is the whole process is you don't hire the people that aren't going to fit into that system because there's only going to be a problem down the road, and and it's a lot to what to what you know you, Cu customer selection. Now, if you want like to, employee if selection, you, you know if you work on your if you work on your management skill, you work on the organization that that spectrum opens up a little bit more and you can take more diverse and you can take it different. But you also tend to attract the right people right. more readily. That's true. When you they know why you're there and what you're supposed to do, that says, oh, I want to play with them. Everybody in the world is looking for a leader to follow. Be that leader. Be that tribe leader, as Seth Godin said. I heard a roofing company one time in a network meeting and there was like three roofing companies at this at this chamber meeting, and they said, you know, we do a great job, but what we, it, it was something along the lines of, um, you know, and we always work to do a great job, but we have to tell you that that no matter how hard we try, everybody screws up once in a while, and what we do is we will, if that happens to be something, we will work to make that right, and nobody ever admits that they screw up, and so he was kind of like saying, you know, and if something does, we will make sure that we make it right, and it was like, wow. You know. That's who you yeah. want. Absolutely. Yep. We all screw up. Yeah. 
So the acronym I want you to walk away with today is ETDBW. Everybody, all together. ETDBW. Easy to do business with. Difficult to say. Yeah. <laughs> five times real fast. <laughs> the customer has to exert energy, effort, and sometimes money to be able to do business with you. Right? So you have to factor their effort in to the whole deal. The price they pay is only part of their total cost. Now, switch the roles around. When you are a customer, that applies to you, right? I would go there, but oh my God, I have to deal with them, or they've got too much inventory, or all, all kind of reasons why it's trouble. Um, Ikea is a very successful store, but you have to be willing to play their game to make that worthwhile, right? So assembling the stuff is part of the cost. Not dollars and cents, but the customer's investment in doing business with you. Yeah, Richard. part of the customer cost to do business with you. Yes, Eric? You, you mentioned Ikea, and you know I, I love the design of their products. Pricing's great. I've been to their store once, and I'll never go back. I'm, I'm not a rat, and I'm not gonna run through their maze. And, and so it's, it, it doesn't matter how much I like their product or their price, I won't go back. Isn't that interesting? It's a very successful model worldwide. But not for everyone. Yeah. yeah, some people love that experience. There's a lot of rats out there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and notice that in the middle of the circuit, there's the cafeteria. Yeah, you know you're trouble. You get tired, <laughs> oh, we need to sit down, and they make it easy for you. All right, we need to move on. What does all of this mean to you? Check what you do to see if you're driving your own customers crazy with repetitive procedures. You ever call for um, the cable company for assistance? Don't even go there. The, the, <laughs> first, the first thing you have to do is please enter your customer code into the, the keypad, right? Then you talk to a live person. What's the first question they ask you? Can I have your customer number? <laughs> just gave it to you. Oh, well, our computer's the, right? That's a, ah. Uh. So are you driving your customers crazy? Sorry, not in use. <laughs> Sorry, we're open. <laughs> if, if you can't read the Walmart one in the lower left, roll back, Waz 350. <laughs> 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 And six people grabbed that item. Notice that somebody spent the time and energy to design and print and install those signs. <laughs> Make it easy for your customers. <laughs> Got it? So, what bugs your customers? They won't tell you most often. And if they do, you'll probably receive it as a complaint. Right? I don't like this. That's your best news. That's the most wonderful thing you can hear is feedback from customers that your process, your business doesn't deliver what they're looking for. I'm not talking about the complaining bitch, right? I'm talking <laughs> about normal customers who want a better experience with you. They already like you. Make it better. Make sense? So remember, the customer experience is the outside of the ring. And what you do 
is on the inside. So when you go back to review this, try to separate out those stars where we do this, pull them inside the circle, and just concentrate <coughs> on the customer and what they're seeing on the outside of the circle. So the issue here is what bugs our customers, how can we fix it? So it's identifying it and then taking action. This is working on your business because this has nothing to do with marketing or sales, collections, anything like that. This is fixing your business system. Make sense? That, that's why we're here. So you want to generate a list, prioritize those things that you're going to take action on because obviously you don't want to spend a lot of time on something people don't really care that much about. Confirm it with real customers. How would you do that? How would you confirm does this bother you with a real customer? Yeah. yeah. Terry? Well, you've got questionnaires, interviews, focus groups. You, know. you, you talk Contact. with them. Yeah, yeah. Talk to them. Ask. Coach them. Yeah. Right. Have, have you ever heard this? Well, if you don't buy, know by now, I'm certainly not going to tell you. That's not the right approach to this. Yeah. Invite them in. Be welcoming for Really? I had no idea that was troubling to you. Let's deal with it. Yes, ma'am. There's a, a software tool by a company called Wufu, and um, you should try, the, try using it in one of these things. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part about Wufu is they're a Tampa, they, were, they originated in Tampa. They're in California now. Um, but they have engineers. Every, every person in their company is required to do customer service, including their most highly paid software engineers. And people on a regular basis say to the owner, why would you have somebody you're paying $125, $250 an hour on customer service? And they're like, well, if a regular customer service person answers the phone, they solve the problem. They solve the problem for each customer. I put an engineer on there, he gets that problem more than once. He goes back to the, to the, to the essence of it, and nobody has that problem ever again. So I think, you know, it's a great it's a great model. Try it. If you have a problem, they'll solve it. If you don't like the customer experience, it's a great tool and it's a great story on where you put your best people. How do you spell it? R U F U. Woo Wufu. I think it's it's like it's either W O O F O O or W U F U something like that. Sarah will find it and send it to us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So you have another handout. And this is a customer bug list. W U F O O. Okay. <laughs> and that other handout is going to look like this. And the intent of this is to go down this first column and identify those moments of truth, those interactions with customers where things could go well or they could go poorly. And then the second column is, so if I were a customer standing in for one of my regular customers, what would I expect to be happening right then? If I was going to the movies and I walked up to the front and I saw the list of movies and the line waiting, what would my expectations be at that moment? Things like the movies are listed and it's an accurate up-to-date list not last week's list, that all the signs illuminated, they weren't half on and half off, right? That there would be enough people behind the, the curtain there to serve the list of the walk-ins that are showing up and so on. And point number two, um, they take charge cards, for example. Or maybe there's a thing you have an online service that I can pre-order tickets and just show up and skip that whole line. You know, things like that. So list all those moments of truth and then observe what's really going on. What really happens. And you have to get out of your own skin to do this. You have to be realistic. Okay? Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, denial does not change reality. Right? If you see it and deny it, like the um, 
hairstylist in the salon, you can't solve it. So you have to be objective. What's really happening there? And then, as a company, you have a brand position. You have a brand identity you want to reinforce. If you're at Disney, for example, Disney has long lines sometimes, right? Do people ever complain about the long lines? Yeah. Well, Occasionally. The line. <laughs> but you know what? Some people look forward to being able to say, I stood in line for an hour. Because Disney understands that and they have ways to deal with that potentially bugless item. Such as they have entertainment, they have mimes going around, they have signs that tell you how long you can expect. They have another system where they put you on a wrist and you can sign in and be there in an hour period and skip the line. They deal with that issue. What does your brand stand for and how do you personalize that at that moment of truth? How do you represent who you are at each moment of truth to that customer? Right? And then the last one is the most really important one. What are you going to do about it? If there's a gap between what is and what should be, fix it. But of course, it's prioritized in such a way that you don't waste your money on stuff people don't really care about. OK. If we had lots of time, we would do this. May I encourage you to take an extra worksheet uh, and if you get in trouble or you want to play with this a little deeper, get hold of me, call me, check in or something, and I'll come sit down with you and we'll work on it privately. Okay? Fair enough? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. So, there are actions over here. This morning we've talked about how customers see your business and what they go through and what we can start to do to fix our business <coughs> system to make it better for our customers. So, okay, I have some questions. Can Let's, I ask one before you get in there? Yes. Okay. No, I'm sorry, time's up. We're all, we're all business owners here, and we can think this is what we're going to do. What is the best way to implement this with your team? Your team's working all day, you can't pull them apart, you take them on a retreat, you take them one at a time. How do you make this a company-wide effort of understanding? You know? How many hours a week does the business work? Fifty. Okay. Could you take one of those hours, have a team meeting, and go over this each week? You can't. We can. We can never get all of ours together because there's too much going on. Could you get some of them together? Yes. Okay. And could you, for example, over the course of a month, rotate that membership to include everybody somehow? Yes. Is that an option? Mm -hmm. That's a way. Sarah, any thoughts? So I actually have a client that I'm working on with this now. And um, so I'm meeting with each one of her um, staff members individually. Uh, and mm -hmm. then we'll have a big team meeting. And then we'll also have some of those, because they cover multiple hours, we'll have some of those that will go into broken up team meetings. Mm -hmm. So. Um, individuals so that they feel like they're important, big team meeting to share the vision with everybody, two smaller groups so that we can keep them on board and take them up into the new information and do that according to how their schedules are because it's not possible to get them all in the same place and on a regular basis. Absolutely. Tom? Is it some of the other problem where one person business? So what I find is you just have to schedule it. You know, I have certain times a week or whatever that this is for this time slot, this is for this right. time slot, and that's the only way I make it work. Tom, do you follow any sports? Yep. Which one? Hockey. Hockey. Does the team you follow have a coach? Yep. Does the coach play the game? No, absolutely not. What do they do then? They, they direct, they do the strategy part of it. Okay. They're outside the business if you want to think of it that Let, way. Let's extend this another level. <laughs> Do you know of any professional sports team anywhere in the world who does not have a coach? No. Or multiple coaches? Baseball, they have position coaches and football and so on. Do you even know individual athletes, golfers, tennis players and so on, who have coaches? Does your business have a coach? 
Sarah, Eric, Richard, we're your coaches. That's what we're going to do for you. Right? So if you are a one-man band, don't be. I think, you know, that's when Bernie started Comtank, you know, I think that's what I loved about it. And I think he even sees a, a bigger vision now that we've all been here. There's lots of people that will never come to this. They won't get up. It's too early. There's all kinds of excuses. But everybody that's here deserves to be commended because you understand that whatever the size your business is, we all need coaches. We all need people to sew into our lives and give us feedback. So I think, I think that's the kind of people I like to work with. And you know, when you look at your business and you look at your customers, you know, invite people. We can invite guests. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One more point, then uh, the next question. So start thinking about what one thing do you remember from this morning? Yeah. This reminds me of how Bill Gates got started. Bill Gates, um, met with IBM and they wanted to buy an operating system. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates didn't have an operating system. But he went back to his team and said, do we, do we have an operating system? No. Do we know anybody that has one for sale? And he sent his team to go work out the, to negotiate buying an operating system, went back to IBM and showed them why buying the, the rights to the operating system was better than buying the operating system. <laughs> and so he became one of the richest men in the world from set, by selling something he didn't even have. He saw an opportunity and then went to his team to find the solution. He didn't have it. That, that's the point of this whole thing. If you knew nothing about your current business and still wanted to do that business, what would you have to do to make that business be able to deliver what it delivers? As the owner, instead of as the technician working in it. That's where we're going with this. Great job, Richard. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, real quick, we'll go around the table. So we'll start with this one and go around this way. From today, what's one thing you remember? Um, well, the, uh, Customer journey is what brings us to my what I need to be doing. Okay. This table, one thing. Look at your business through the customer's eyes. Yeah. And why is that important? So that you can satisfy them. Because they're from Venus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's one thing from this table, please? Improve the customer experience. That's all you've got. That's what you're really selling. The products and services are a vehicle to deliver a good customer experience. This table. Pick the right customers. Pick the right customers. <laughs> That's excellent. Okay, going backwards then, back to Bernie's issue. What are you going to actually use, if anything, from today? And it's okay to say nothing. No, I, I really like your the concept of your wheel here. and. This is always my time of the year where I do this, so it's a great time to get ready for next year. So I need a copy, another copy of this before I go. They're right up here on the front oh. table. Thank you for the setup. This table, what are you actually going to do? Oh, we're in the process of, of running through a lot of these with, with my organization, <coughs> so it, it's good to have a focus list uh, from a different perspective to, to incorporate that. The key point here is this is a big elephant in the room. You can't eat an elephant in a bite. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. One bite at a time. So you'll have to approach, here's the big picture, let's just do this for now, and then we can add on later. Does that make sense? Don't try to, you know, leap the chasm to the end. Go through it systemically. This table. You're going to actually use something. Anybody? Yeah. Well, I'm just starting a new business, so I'm going to look at my business, you know, from the outside and develop a system. You know, really think about the outside, uh, you know, and this is a good time for me because I'm not so loaded down right now with the inside part of my business. Absolutely. That I have the time right now to build the outside. 
Yes. Oh, I've read that several times. And I, and I did the summary before I came to you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. From this table, a, a to-do. I, I have always been trying to work on those elements around the circle. Okay. And what I'm taking away from today is it will be a lot easier if I share with all of our staff the whole system so they can work on it instead of me. Oh, that's so important. Yeah. If they don't have so buy-in, they're seeing it from their little point of view. Yeah. They know what they're supposed to do. It's no good. And that's, that's the room full of car parts. Yeah. Right? Each one is good, but they don't work together like we want them.